Welcome to Let's Talk Careers, a talk show for students, hosted by students, and we're your student hosts. Hi, Hi, I'm Taylor, a senior at Wheaton High School in Thomas Edison. And I'm Ashley, a junior at Galesburg High School. And I'm Nick, your SMOB and a senior at Richard Montgomery High School. We're delighted to introduce our career guests for today from the world of arts and entertainment. Welcome to Let's Talk Careers. Our first speaker for today is Mr. Lewis Black. Mr. Black, a Springbrook High School graduate, is a comic actor, writer, and playwright. In 2001, he won Best Male Stand-Up at the American Comedy Awards. He has released eight comedy albums and has won two Grammy Awards. Mr. Black has three New York Times bestsellers, including Nothing Sacred. He was also a writer in residence for the Roundhouse Theater right here in Bethesda, and the voice of anger in the popular movie Inside Out. His newest special, Thanks for Risking Your Life, premiered October 6, 2020, and was his last live performance before the COVID lockdown. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Taylor, and it's a pleasure to be back in Montgomery County, even virtually. Ms. Tatiana Wexler is a New York City-based performing artist and songwriter who has performed at theaters in many venues regionally and on and off of Broadway. She was the first woman to play Curly in Oklahoma, and her TV and film credits include a short film, Net User. Ms. Wexler is a fierce advocate for equity, justice, joy, and love, and is honored to be able to pursue her passions. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. And last but not least, Mr. Brian King Joseph, originally from Maryland, has been leading the way for modern electric violinists, both nationally and worldwide, gaining his fame during season 13 of America's Got Talent, where he finished third. Mr. Joseph has taken the world by storm, covering huge hits across multiple genres and now releasing his original songs. Welcome to our show. Hey, what's up, man? Thank you so much for having me here. It's a pleasure to be, you know, back here, and I'm excited for this. Thank you all for being here today. This show is coming to you live via YouTube by the way of Zoom. Before we start our interview questions, I want to briefly talk about the importance of Let's Talk Careers. This show is designed to let students learn about different career paths and the journeys of successful men and women, just like the speakers with us today. Students are submitting questions live via our YouTube chat and have also sent in questions prior to today's show to ask our guests. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. This question, this next question is posed to all of our speakers. Um, do you ever get never nervous before a performance or before you go on stage? And if so, how do you get through it? We can start with Mr. Black, um, then move on to Ms. Wexler and, and with Mr. Peterson. You're starting with me? I, well, initially it was, uh, it, it was brutal for me and uh, because I wasn't, it was a difficult transition. I was a writer and I was transitioning to become a performer and it was, it was tough. Uh, and, um, but, uh, uh, you know, I would, I would basically, I would talk as fast as I could and yell a lot, and that kind of helped. <laughs> and, um, but really, uh, uh, what, what, what really helped mostly was just doing it over and over and over again, and finally, being realizing if I don't relax, the audience doesn't relax, and that that's as important as anything else that you bring on the stage is your level of being comfortable. And that was the real turning point, but it took a long time. Yeah, for me, the short answer is yes, every single time in varying degrees. I will say the, the time I felt it the most was when I played uh, Curly in Oklahoma, the musical Rogers and, Rogers and Hammerstein's Oklahoma at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. I was so terrified because Curly starts the show with a solo and I was the first woman to play the role. So it was all the pressure of, you know, the show starts and the audience immediately will think this is how they're doing the show. Okay, let's see how this is. And I swear every single time I thought, what if I just run out the door? I was already in costume. The orchestra already played the overture. I thought, 
life might be okay if I run away, but I didn't. I did it every single time. And the way I did, I had a breathing exercise I would do. And I would try to think about just the very first moment I had to do and the rest would just follow. So yes, breathing and just staying in the specific moment is what helps me. Uh, yeah, I, uh, used to get really nervous when I was a little younger, but I would say I got nervous when I was practicing and I was getting ready to go into these competitions. I was doing these big competitions for violinists in the state. And the first time I placed in one of these competitions, I had made a mistake in the show, in the actual performance. And I was so surprised to place in actually, and the judges wrote, you may have made a mistake, but your presence and the way you handled it and everything is what sold the performance for us. And that told me moving from that point on um, that as long as I was more excited than I was nervous, that everything would be okay. So nerves are always going to be there um, before a big performance, but I try my best to be really excited. So that just overlaps, overtops how nervous you are. Nervous being the little thing, excited being the big thing. And it generally works out for me. That's all great to hear. And just from listening to that, it obviously seems like you are all pros and have had, you know, uh, pretty interesting and pretty long career. So what was your first job in the industry and how did that impact the course of your career? Let's start with you, Mr. Black. What, my first job? Um, yep. I, it, it, my first job was in the industry was uh, it really, I, I wrote a, I wrote a play in school while I was in college. So, I mean, I don't, you know, and, uh, and they did it. And that was the, that was it. That was as much, a, that's as much a job as I had when somebody else did a play of mine. Uh, I, I started as a playwright and, and wrote a lot of plays. And so uh, um, that was really my first, my first job. And that was the thing that got me uh, hooked on really wanting to do it. I was, uh, you know, I, I really felt that that was, uh, that really was what I wanted to do. Awesome. And how about you, Miss Wexler? Uh, I had a couple gigs out of school. I will say the most memorable, um, the, the show that I got my equity card, which is the uh, union for theater. I was in the ensemble of a Yiddish operetta with the National Yiddish Theater. And the ensemble was not union. And the main cast, the, the leads were all union. And we didn't have understudies. And it was a classic story of one of the leads had an emergency. And so Monday night after curtain, the producers come to me and say, can you learn the role? We want to, we need to throw you on. The show must go on. You have two days to learn this role in Yiddish, which I don't fully speak. Most people in the cast don't actually speak. And they said, and we have to make you union to do it. So I did it. I don't really remember much of it, but I got through it. And, um, and then I was part of the union. So that was a, a good way to, to just jump into the union and say, if I did that, I can probably do most things. Uh, and like yeah, an insane experience. And like you said, a great way to jump start into the, uh, the industry. And how about you, Mr. Joseph? Um, so my first foray into the industry is actually just purely on the streets of DC DuPont circle. If you, you guys, you know, probably have seen been around there and Chinatown Metro, uh, I really needed to make money. <laughs> and, uh, so I said, okay, let me go out on the street and start playing. Um, and I, you know, played for a little while, maybe a few weeks, maybe a few months actually, before I actually ended up getting my very first gig at the Atlas theater, uh, for step Africa. And the director of the show had walked by the Chinatown Metro. He was getting off the Metro to go to work. And he said, Hey, do you want to perform with us this, this summer? And I said, absolutely. You know, that was my first job. And I felt um, that that was really my first foray into the industry. The first time I got to do something for real. 
I love these answers. That is absolutely amazing. Um, so you came into such a big industry, but was there someone specific who inspired you to go into arts and entertainment and why? We can start this off with Ms. Wexler, Ms. Ms. Wexler, sorry, uh, Mr. Joseph, and then Mr. Black. Sure. Um, I knew from a very young age that this is what I wanted to do. I think some of the big things that inspired me, my family loves the arts and I grew up watching all these golden age musical movies and we would go to the theater. Um, big things for me were Gene Kelly musicals, all the things from that era I would, I would watch nonstop and then um, try to imitate them and sing in my backyard and pretend I was Debbie Reynolds. Um, so I loved all of that. And because my family was so supportive of it, uh, I was able to start doing those things at a young age. So all, all the golden age stuff, um, and, and just my family's support, I would say is what got me into it. Great. We can move this one on to Mr. Joseph. Oh, sorry. Um, so I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes, for sure. So is there anyone who inspired you to go into arts and entertainment and why? Ah, right. Okay, so I did have an answer for this. Uh, I want to give credit to, you know, my mom and the school for allowing me to have violin lessons um, and playing music in the car that I resonated with that was played by violinists. Uh, but I think, and not to sound selfish, but to be self-inspiring is that I really wanted to do something in the industry for myself to, to be the violinist that I saw myself being. So I want to say that my biggest inspiration was myself day to day, um, saying, I'm going to do this. I got to do this. Uh, and you know, after some time, it just, it comes to being, you know, with a lot of hard work, um, and not losing focus of that goal. So, yeah. Thank you so much. That is, it is really inspiring. Um, this next question is from Mr. Black. How have your experience in theater, writing, comedy, and acting complemented one another? They're all, um, they all feed each other. Um, Stand-up comedy in the end, I think, it, and it's it's why I've kind of, uh, I've, I've spent time teaching it. Uh, it's the teaching more the experience of what it's like rather than go become a comic. That no, but just to actors uh, is because stand-up is one way in which you're you've written it, you're directing it, and you're performing it, and you, you're doing that all simultaneously. So, um, so every time you've, you, every time I act, some I, I, I'm reading things that someone has written brilliantly, much more brilliantly than I have written things, and someone is directing me, and I'm not, a, I've never, I've never liked directing, but someone is directing me who's really good at it. So you're always being given, a, a, you're always learning. Uh, about the other, about the varieties, about what's within your craft. And so they all feed off each other. And I think it's how we uh, evolve as artists. And the more that I think that you can um, take that risk and, and, and move into these other areas from time to time, uh, the more you'll learn. When you, if, you've given, if you're given that opportunity, you'll find that uh, there's something that you'll learn from it. And that that I've, I've been lucky to be able to experience that. So interesting how all of your different skill sets really mesh together. Uh, for Ms. Wexler, how did you realize becoming an actor, singer, and songwriter is something you wanted to do, even though it is a difficult industry to break into? Yes. Um, I just really didn't want to do anything else um, and knew that there wasn't anything else I wanted to do. I recently found an, an old journal, I think I, I must have been very young, and I, and I said, oh yeah, this is definitely what I want to do. Um, 
I just always loved it. I don't know where it came from. My family loved music and the arts and movies, and we would put on these shows, fairly elaborate, I would say, family shows. We would, you know, do spins of um, Annie and Oliver and Guys and Dolls, all these shows. And I loved it. And I got the opportunity at a young age to do uh, theater in community theater and then be the children's ensembles in some professional theater. And that really told me, oh yeah, this is definitely what I want to do. And a question coming in from YouTube to follow up on that, you know, what's your advice for anyone who's an aspiring singer? Are there any resources for vocal training that you can suggest? Yes, uh, I definitely think vocal training. Um, I would say find a teacher even now when um, you can't do it in person, there are lots of teachers teaching online. So find a teacher who, who can really work with you and get to know you specifically and, and craft their lessons based on your talent and your voice and, and get into some training. You know, I, I do think Google and YouTube are very powerful tools and you can learn a lot from it. But when it comes to specific things like training your voice, I would say steer towards getting a teacher who's specifically working with you, not a general YouTube lesson, because it won't, you might find some good basic information, but you need it tailor-made to you, I would say. So get in there, get some classes. Thank you for the amazing advice. Um, Mr. Joseph, we have a question for you. What steps did you take to become a professional violinist and when did you realize that that was possible? <laughs> um, you know, I have a very interesting, uh, I would say, career in the sense that there aren't many people who do exactly what I do. There are a lot of people who play violin, but in the exact modern way, there's a lot, it's a smaller selection of us. Um, so making it to where I have, it has been a lot of trial and error and a lot of it starting from the ground. Like I said, um, I started out playing on the street and a lot of it was just to me, music is about connecting with people. Arts is about connecting with people. Um, you know, we relate and so we consume and enjoy. And I took playing, to the, playing on the street as a big learning experience for me to see um, out of necessity, really, because for me, I had to attract the biggest crowds so that I could eat more than just ramen that night or that week. Um, and the bigger crowds you attract, the more that that would make other people then come, your, your crowd begins to exponentially grow. Uh, so it really became a thing about me trying to figure out what works, what do people really like? And, you know, you're going to find out pretty quickly when you're playing for people who are just rushing to work and they don't really have time. You have to make something that makes them turn around and stop. So me starting there, uh, I think set up everything else, which is just about focusing on the people that you're trying to connect to. Um, so then I did shows and then I also went to school like Tatiana, like Miss Weschler said, this super important go out and seek um, some learning, some some people that are really going to hold your hand and say this is what you really need to do because um, that was instrumental. That was very instrumental in what uh, how I got to the level I'm at. Uh, and then from then on, it's just a matter of saying, well, what do people like? What do I want people to see? Uh, and so I put it on YouTube. We have the internet now, right, guys? Like, you can put all your stuff out. You can do Twitch. You can do YouTube, TikTok, everything. Uh, so it's about finding what's there for you to use right right now. Back when I was on the street, YouTube wasn't the hugest thing. Uh, but then when it became a little bigger, you know, I said, hey, here's a platform for me. Um and then from there, YouTube is how people from America's Got Talent found me and said, hey, you should audition. Uh, so it's those little steps building up those little, little things. It all culminates at the end of it, as long as you just stick to it. Thank you for that. And I assume one of the biggest steps that you went through was being on America's Got Talent. Um, what was it like being on America's Got Talent? <laughs> uh, uh, 
to shorten it to a few words, uh, it was one of, it was the most exciting experience, elongated experience I've had in my life to be, to go from that grind that I was just talking about where, you know, I'm playing in the street, I'm playing for whatever small gig I could get. Sometimes playing for 30 people in a bar and they could really care less. But I would always make sure to connect with those couple of people. When I got to America's Got Talent, it was just like everything that I had done, but on steroids, just an, an incredible experience to have 5,000, thousands of people, millions of people watching and thousands of people actually there cheering you on. Uh, I felt like it was an experience that I was ready for. I was made to do. Um, so I had always thought in my head, this is something that I wanted to do. When it finally came, I was very, very excited to do it. I got to meet, you know, the judges. And um, one of the best things was really just having everything that I worked on uh, be ready to be shown and having people actually like it and say that say that it's good um because i went from you know not really having a career more of a prospect of a career which is I'll, in this industry you're gonna have that a lot i you know i know there are a lot of comedians who have talked about starting in that one club in the beginning and the person not even knowing their name messing it up and maybe I've, I've heard so many comedians talk about bombing you know and it's they're huge you know and we've got people like Mr. Black here and Tatiana you already know as well it's the little steps that take you to that prepare you for that huge one and then you're at the Broadway edition or you're in a Hollywood movie, uh, and it's it's that it's that quick as long as you're ready. So you know, speaking of those steps that I guess prepare you for uh, your career later on in the future, you guys were touching on this a little bit. But are there any specific classes or workshops or degrees that are valuable to have in your field? Um, for example, you know, do you need to go to acting school to become an actor, uh, Mr. Black? Why don't we start with you? I think um, if uh, I think that it's important if you if you want to pursue uh, if you want to pursue being an actor, do I think it's important to go to an acting school? I think it it, it makes a it makes a great deal of difference, and only because only because it gives you the opportunity to act day after day after day after day after day. Um, if you uh, if you you know can find it. And, and I think it's important. I've known uh, uh, really, uh, you know, I've known kids who were really great actors when I was working in, uh, in, in Montgomery County who went on to college who were already, I knew were going to be active. But they went and they took, they went to college. College, they, it all gave them the opportunity to take courses because it's not just about acting. It's also about um, learning and learning things and, and experiencing things. You know, it's about learning history and reading fiction and then uh, social and all the other stuff. It's important to, to load the arsenal of your brain up with, uh, with that type of, with knowledge. So if you want to write, I think it's important too. I mean, there are people who can do it without it. For me personally, um, I needed the guidance. And, um, and I think the... The arts, uh, if you if you find that if you find if you're able to go to a, a junior college and get it, just a place in which to be able to go and practice it. I mean, I ended up going to graduate school in in uh, theater mainly because it was like I wasn't nobody was going to take my play down at uh, arena stage, but I could go and have my plays done in a graduate school. That definitely makes sense. You know, the part about having those opportunities to practice day in and day out. Uh, Ms. Wexler, what about, you know, what are your opinions on this? Yes, I think training is absolutely necessary. For me, I knew I was someone who really would benefit from it. I think it's up to each person to decide what that will look like for you, whether that's, you know, a four-year college, a conservatory program, whatever it is. I also think 
you know, even if it just, even if the school has a fancy name, maybe they won't be the right program for you. So finding people who see you as an individual and want to, um, be a part of, of building you as an artist, um, and not make a cookie cutter money-making machine. Um, I will also say part of me felt, okay, once I'm done with this four-year program, I'm going to come out this well-oiled, perfect, perfectly formed artist. And that's not really true. You know, the learning continues. It's not as if after those four years, you're done learning about being an actor and you're going to be perfect. You'll, you'll learn on every gig you do and you'll learn from just your life experiences. So the training comes from everywhere. I will also say for me, school was very important in finding um, mentors and they have been really important mentors for me. That's been invaluable, almost worth the price of admission for college itself was just these people who are working professionals in the business who know me and what I do. And I ask them things all the time, you know, should I sign with this agent? Should I accept this contract? Um, and they're in my corner. So knowing who can be on your team and getting that training, super important. That sounds great. It seems like a common theme is that you're constantly working on your craft and constantly learning from those experiences you get. Uh, Mr. Joseph, do you have any uh, input on this as well? Um, no, I think that that was perfect. Really, what Mr. Black, Mr. Weschler, like uh, Miss Mr. Weschler, that's they they touched on it all. Really, um, it's up to you um, what you think is best for you. Uh, but all of those things, the training and and the experience, um, they can't be overlooked. You do need to find and seek it out in your own way, whichever way that is. It's a big world. We have a lot of different options. Now, you know, traditional college isn't the only thing, the end all of be all. I'm a college dropout, but I did use my time in college uh, to hone my craft every day. And so, yeah. Going off of the topic of college, um, a question from YouTube. Did nice. you go to college and if, oh, yes, go ahead. I just wanted to add something, if I might. And that yes, is, yes. Uh, you will find, I'm just gonna throw this out here. You're gonna find certain teachers along the way um, who were frustrated because they didn't achieve their goal as they didn't become the actor or the writer or the whatever that they wanted to become. And they will, and they're not great teachers and they will torture you. And my experience in graduate school, to be honest with you, was horrible. But I did learn from all of the students around me who were really bright and really brilliant. And, um, and so to be, to be conscious of the fact too, that when you set out to do this, that you, you have something within you that's ticking that you want to express. And when someone along the way is, when you turn to your friends when you kind of come out of a class and you thought something was off, ask them, was, is this person is, who's teaching me crazy? Because we had crazy people teaching us. Do I think that's evolved? Yes. Because people in my generation who were taught by some real people that shouldn't have been teaching, um, went on to become teachers. And I think that there's been an evolution in arts teaching and it's, in, and it's made a major difference. And so, but, but just keep an eye out because uh, you don't need that. For sure, thank you for that. Um, so again, the question from YouTube, I'm going off of the topic of college and teaching. Did you go to college? And if so, what did you study? We can start off with Ms. Wexler, go on to Mr. Joseph and then Mr. Black. Sure. Um, I went to NYU, New York University, uh, the, uh, an undergraduate program at the Tisch School of the Arts. Um, I was the first year of this new program called the New Studio on Broadway. Um, and I did acting in musical theater. So theater, acting, singing, dancing, all that stuff, four years of it. Amazing. Thank you. Can we move to Mr. Joseph? Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, the question is, did I go to college? Right. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I did go to college. I went to Berkeley college of music. Uh, 
to be completely honest, I wasn't absolutely sure that there was a college out there for me. Uh, like I said, I had started playing on the street. I was, you know, getting into my rock bands and stuff like that. Somebody told me about this really cool cons uh, uh, conservatory where, you know, they're open to new types of musicians and you know going towards modern stuff and i'm like wow this is cool like john mayer went to the school and aerosmith and so i'm gonna go be one and i went to berkeley you know i got a scholarship it was a really wonderful experience uh i got so i wanted to say i didn't just drop out by the way uh because i was like ah i don't want to do this it was it was a wonderful place for me to be i got sick uh a year into it uh, and stayed as long as I possibly could before I had to drop out. Um, some of you know that I had a nerve disease that I developed right in that time in Berkeley. So um, I had to, you know, step back and reprioritize because it was getting absolutely impossible to just walk to class. So, yeah, uh, I think it was just a really, really amazing um experience that because I, I know so many people now that i was able to um be friends with talk about music and and just be around that environment that spurred my creative juices and and drive you, you want to be around people that are going to be ambitious you know so that you can be ambitious as well a little Thank healthy for, competition. Yes, for sure. Thank you for that. Um, and we can move to Mr. Black. Um, you know, one thing uh, Brian points out by getting into Berkeley is a, uh, that's huge positive reinforcement when they pick you out. When a school, it's another reason to just apply to certain places because it will give you a sense of where you might be. Um, and Berkeley is a great music school. There's like a number in the country, not a ton. Um, I went to the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and I went there uh, specifically because they had a theater school, but, uh, but they also had a big, a great English department. And I tried desperately to find anything else that I could be in other than theater, because it made no sense. Nobody in my family was in theater. I liked, I loved theater. My, my family liked uh, Miss Wexler's family, they're the ones who got me suckered into this thing. I, they took me to play. I was like, oh, this is phenomenal. I really want to do this. Um, but I tried, to, I took every course I could possibly take in, in look for any other major. Um, and uh, in, in, uh, it, it really became just uh, a major in theater. And I was lucky enough to be able to, uh, I discovered all sorts of things that they didn't even know that they had in their catalog so I could craft my own kind of course. And I, I, I managed, which they didn't know at the time, to, to graduate with what became, because of reinforcement, uh, an emphasis in playwriting. And uh, I was able to do the, with a friend of mine, we were able to do the, the first uh, play that was produced he was a he wrote music and we did a musical it was the first play produced at the at the uh, at the opening of the theater in uh, at George Washington University while I was in an undergrad so there was a tremendous amount of opportunity that I was given yes thank you guys for sharing all of that and I just want to swing back to Mr. Joseph you did mention your struggle with your nerve disease and many of us know that you've been pretty open about it, both on and off social media. Um, so how do you deal with your neuropathy and still manage to be such a phenomenal player? Uh, well, you know, there are people ask me a lot. Um, I think it's actually a common thing for people to say, hey, how do I deal with the obstacles? Um, because they can be anything, right? And for me, I never expected an obstacle that would directly affect my ability to play my instrument. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the neuropathy. 
what happens is that the small nerves in my fingers, like my pinky, starting at the smallest little muscles and nerves in your body, your tips of your fingers, tips of your toes, um, begin to first be in, in incredible pain and then slowly die, which then makes you not able to feel certain parts of your hand or wherever it's happening you forget to use these tiny muscles there because you can't feel them anymore. Um, this leads the muscles to slowly atrophy and, uh, you know, ending up in complete, uh, you know, non-use of your hands and your feet and what have you. So when this happened to me, and it's something that is puts you in a lot of pain, a great amount of pain, uh, and I'm this, you know, young guy and I'm like, Hey, what, why is this happening to me? You know, I, <laughs> I should be, you know, everything should be smooth sailing. I've already gotten into Berkeley, you know, this is, this is it. Like this, everything's perfect only uphill from here. And when I realized that this is what I was going through and I went through a big period of like, Oh gosh, why me? Um, this is terrible, how am I going to get out of it, to realizing that the only way for me to continue in a long-term, in a long-term fashion was to not actually stop moving um, these guys as much as possible. And I'll tell you right now, even when I'm moving it now, it feels a lot better to do nothing, right? It feels a lot better to just let my hands rest than to do this and always make sure that these muscles are not dying. Okay. But it's worth it because I absolutely love, love, love playing the violin, making the music that I make for people, seeing the reactions on their face. It's something I don't want to live without or something I want to live with for as long as I possibly can. Uh, so knowing that every morning I wake up and I say to myself, no matter what's going on here, the fact that I can still do what I love to any degree, any extent is not only making me happy, but there are millions of people out there. And this is something I didn't realize, um, when I, until I first got on America's Got Talent and actually talked about it, there are actually millions of people out there that are hurting. They may not have the exact same obstacles, challenges that you have or that I have, but the feeling is similar. And we all need somebody to say to us, you got this, you can do it. And sometimes that person has to be you. And when it, that person is you and you feel like, oh man, there's nobody else in my corner. Like, what, how am I going to do this? Understand that you're fighting a battle that other people aren't sure is even fightable, but it is. And when they see you just fighting that battle, it's going to make them want to join in too and say, yeah, I can too. And I think that's really... It gives me a lot of purpose in life. It gives me a lot of uh, happiness, even though, you know, I'm in constant pain. Uh, if you love the thing you want to do, whatever that is, love it with all your heart because nothing will get in the way of it then. You will always find a way to get um, the thing that you love, the thing that you want. And so... That's really, I think, what does it for me. Just the love of the craft trumps whatever hardships are in the way. They can get out of the way. <laughs> wow, that was that was truly so inspiring. And, you know, thank you for being so open about that and sharing your story. I think that's something that a lot of students needed to hear. And thank you for raising awareness about the struggles that you face and the challenges that you faced uh, throughout your careers. And I guess to our other two guests, you know, um, what's a challenge that you guys have maybe faced in your careers too that you'd be willing to talk about? Um, Mr. Black, let's start with you. Well, in comparison, nothing, nothing, zip. What, what, what? 
getting out of, gee, I'm really, I got a, 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 the alarm didn't go off. No, I mean, it's, I, I get the question, but you, 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 I'd really have to think, I'd have to make something up. I think what Brian just said, um, to be honest, was as important as anything we have to say here today. Seriously, in terms of, in terms of mentoring, in terms of passing on what it's beyond what it is we do, and that's the core of it. It's the core of anything anyone wants to do. Is uh, is what he just said. I mean, it was stunning. Um, I've had, you know, the only thing I've had is, you know, you you, you work in look, you work in the entertainment industry. It's an industry. Well, you know, and you work with a lot of people. This is, and this is minimal compared, but it's, it, this is really the, the uh, part of the story. You work with people, you, you bring in something that you've spent years working on, and you hand it to somebody who's never worked, who's definitely never even studied this stuff. They don't even know what it's about, but they've been put in a position of power. So a lot of the times you're dealing with people who are way more powerful than you and have much less knowledge. And, uh, and it, it's, it, it's astonishing. And, I've, uh, and my problem was, uh, if I had a problem, was, is I would tell them that. And you, that's something you don't do. You don't say to the person who's in charge, hey, you're an idiot. And I didn't in so many ways. I actually said it at times worse because it was appalling. Because I devoted my time and life to this. And even if you don't like it, at least come up with something, something interesting to say. I once was, a, a script was rejected that, that I wrote with two other people um, for a major, for like Fox or CBA, one of, the, one of those. And they, they uh, FX. And they said, this is what they said, that the script was too funny too funny for FX. Well, what do you say? What do you say in response? That's the criticism? So you're, that's the type of nonsense you deal with. But I think that that kind of nonsense, and eventually I realized, and it's important for all of you who are listening, when you're dealing with an idiot, just keep it to yourself. You don't know where along the line you're going to have to see that idiot again. Just shut up. I didn't, and it took. As a result, it took me much longer to get to where I was trying to get to, but I was able to do my work because I didn't really. Uh, I, I was able to do it in all sorts of other ways. So I found every avenue I could. I did not need to be on CBS or NBC or all, all of those places, but in the end, I think going back, it's it's really what what Brian had to say. That was really stunning. So thanks. And Thank you, man. And thank you for that advice. I think that 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 whole situation really just speaks to to your skills as a comedic writer, writing a script that's too funny. Uh, Miss Wexler, do you have any challenges that you overcame, or any advice that you'd want to share about overcoming challenges? I mean, yes, these gentlemen have summed it up beautifully. I I think something that can be really challenging is in the madness of the business it's so easy to lose the childhood spark that you got for why you love it so remembering that there's a reason why you love to do this and finding um finding ways to express that even if you're stuck in the business aspect uh, i heard someone also say if you are in a room that feels like you have to prove your worth then it might not be the right room. So there, there are times you have to rise to the occasion, but if you're surrounded by people who uh, aren't seeing your worth, that can be challenging. And also, yeah, physically it's, if it's, this is something you love and you put your whole body in, it, it will take a toll on your body. So learning to take care of myself has been challenging. I've been injured in shows and things like that. Um, so the spark and take care of yourself. And it's a tough business, but, if you love it, you should do it. And, you know, speaking along those lines of uh, sometimes being in a room where you're not appreciated for your craft, someone from YouTube is ask, actually asking you, Ms. Wexler, you know, um, has being a woman or person of color impacted your opportunities in the industry? 
Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's who I am. So it's, everything's affected by who everyone is. I, there are definitely specific things in terms of, you know, instances where I I'm in for a role. And I think it's maybe only because of, you know, outside characteristics and not actually my essence of who I am. Um, so that there can be a lot of times of feeling like you're not actually seen for your full humanity. And that can be really um, demoralizing at times. Um, yeah, yeah. I've been fortunate to work with a lot of wonderful people. And but, you know, sometimes I get auditions and read the part and I think, wow, OK, this is all, all that's there. Great. Not a lot of well-roundedness to it. Um Yes, I feel like there is change coming. There is change that's been happening. I think it's better now than it was before. I think there's a lot further to go. Um, and and I, again, that's why I think it was very important for me to have mentors um, because they kept me grounded through all of it. Um, and I specifically have a lot of my mentors are black men and women, and that's been very um, wonderful and uh, affirming. Thank you guys all for sharing those personal stories. We, we really do appreciate it. I'm sure our students do it as well. Um, so this next question is also from YouTube for Mr. Black. Um, what was it like playing anger in Inside Out? <laughs> oh, I love that movie. Yeah, it was, it was uh, really great. Um, first off, because I got to, you know, you can't beat a job where you get to just go in and yell. Okay. <laughs> For those of you who are, you know, dealing with confinement or, or di distance learning and all of that stuff that can make you crazy, just go off somewhere and scream for a while. I mean it. Just yell about anything. It will make you feel better. It's, it's a release. But to be able to work just on that simple level, but also I was working with Pixar, which is truly an extraordinary organization and unusual within... Uh, within entertainment, uh, it, it, you don't find this type of thing. They don't. They're not in Los Angeles. They're not in New York. They're in. They're away from it. They're outside of uh, San Francisco. They have their own kind of campus, uh, and I. You you go there, and you. It takes five years from the time that they contact you until that uh, until it's done until the animation is done as a five-year process. So uh, it's really, you. it's the one place I've ever been in the totality of the time I've worked in, in, this, uh, in, this, in, in doing this, where you actually were, you saw um, the creative process from all directions. So that you actually saw, it. when you do a movie, you come in, you do the movie, you know, you might see, you, you never see the editing, you don't, but you've got to see, you know, the evolution of your, of the character in, in terms of the way they animated it, of the story, of the backgrounds, of the, of the other characters. Um, we all did it alone. As far as I know, um, uh, you know, we all did it. Uh, I know that I work by myself. Um, and they're just a brilliant group of people to work with who really have uh, an, an, an inordinate sense of the value of the artist working in front of them. It, it's really something it, which is unusual in this, in this business um, to have that type of thing. To give you a sense of it, Pixar sent me after they had done, this is, think about this, they'd done all of this stuff, Toy Story, yada, yada, the Nemo, everything. They sent me a package of stuff. I was like one of the first, I was literally the first person they asked to do it. And um, and they sent me stuff and they, they sent me all of their stuff and said, you may not know about us. And I thought, are you serious? What kind of humility does that take? Also, did they think I was a shut-in, that I was just kind of living in a cave somewhere? But it, it showed a humility on their part that you don't find from others. So it was probably one of the the, 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 the one of the, the most um, fulfilling 
artistic experiences in my life. And I just was a teeny little part. Thank you for that. I absolutely enjoyed hearing about that. I know I am a big fan of Pixar and especially of your movie. Um, you featuring as Anger is absolutely amazing to me. Um, fangirling a little bit, not going to lie to you. <laughs> but um, another question we have from YouTube, for those of you who produce, what software do you use and how do you learn it? We can start this off with um, Mr. Joseph, move on to... Ms. Wexler, if you have anything to add, and Mr. Black, if you have anything to add. Don't come to me with software. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, man, I just I just want to say, gosh, I love that movie. Um, I think it's one of the best movies uh, Pixar put out in recent you know, history. And your part was, was spot on, man. Like, you can tell it's you. And I, I, you say it's a small part, but I think it's a pivotal role actually in the entire movie so um i i'm sure most of you everybody here has probably seen it already but if you haven't gosh go watch that movie it will it ha it will help you I, it helped me as like a i was in my i'm in my 20s and it helped me and it's fantastic anyway um uh, uh the recording audio uh, recording um uh, daw as they call it the that i use is logic native to uh you know, Mac books and Mac in general. Uh, that's what they taught us in Berkeley. Um, I will say this. Uh, most of all of these programs, you've got Logic, Ableton, Pro Tools. They're all generally the same. They can all do the same thing. What it comes down to is workflow. How comfortable do you feel with the shortcuts and the and the built-in tools, how it's everything's laid out, how it looks. Um, and I found that a lot of people can make the exact same quality of music, whether they're using Logic, Pro Tools, or Ableton, or anything else. Um, learning it, just like Miss Wexler said, yeah, YouTube and Google are amazing, uh, <laughs> amazing resources. Uh, you can literally... Uh, any problem that you're having while you're producing, um, if you're not lucky enough to go or to have a teacher right there, you know, maybe at your school or something that you can ask this question, you can just type it into YouTube, um, into the search bar, and there will most likely be a video spe specifically addressing that uh, one troubleshooting problem that you have. Um, and I think that's how I learned. Um, it was a lot of, a lot of me throwing the dart completely missing i'm talking terrible mixes okay <laughs> um absolutely just fundamental recording things that i did that i completely overlooked that after i got my final product that i you know said okay this is my song and i listened back and i said well this i hear some discrepancies this sounds crappy or this sounds cool but it's not loud enough or whatever um it's it's a big trial and error thing finding your sound right we all have different sounds as artists you know uh so find something that's comfortable for you i will point out that i think the industry standard and uh miss wexler if you can probably add to this i think the industry standard what i normally see is pro tools especially you know for the traditional regular music um if you're doing edm uh i see a lot of ableton uh, so it's again up to you what you want to learn. I would suggest dabbling in all of them and then picking one. Yeah, for me, I um, I didn't know about any of this stuff a year ago. I have had a music training and I've been singing my whole life. But when the shutdown happened, I said, you know what? I've always wanted to learn about this stuff. Let me do it. And I had some theaters commission some concerts for me. So I said. I, I will do it all. I will produce it, film it, edit it. I will make it all. And so what, how I learned was Google and YouTube. I use Logic as well. And truly, it's, it's funny because I think back to even six months ago, I know so much more now. I feel like I'm really just starting to learn about it. And it's so exciting and so fun um, to see how much faster I am at it now. And it's all been from YouTube and Google. So this is one instance where I think they can be your teacher, <laughs> um, get all that information and mess around with it. Yeah. I, I think all that you said was 
terrific. So it's fun. You can do it. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you for, for that advice. I know I've tried to make a couple mixes myself and they didn't, they didn't work out well, but, um, <laughs> another question coming in from YouTube, uh, what's the one thing you like most about your career and what's the one thing you like least about your job? Let's start off with you, Mr. Black. The one thing I like most about it is, is that I, uh, I've always loved doing it. So, I mean, it's always been even before that I can go back to when I just finally had an income. I mean, an income being that I was, I could make it day to day. I had enough money for a week, but no, nothing else, no health, no nothing. Um, and, and at that point I was 30, uh, and, uh, which is when you're supposed to be really rolling. That's what people believe. Um, and I, and I, and I can look back at that and I was as happy then as I am now. That's really the, 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 the great gift of it. Um, because I did things that were, that, and was involved with, people that it was a really uh it, it has always been a, a joy to me to do this i wake up and i don't th and even though uh I, i'd be working 12 hours i've never thought about it never thought oh gee i didn't make any money today i never thought about that um uh, the worst thing about it is uh that it is that watching people that you know and this is just quickly because uh, there are probably other things that I could, if we had a worse list, I could probably sit here forever. Um, but the worst thing is that really it was watching people you know are phenomenally talented and not getting their due. I know comedians who uh, should, should be seen more uh, have a larger audience. They don't, even with YouTube and all of that. Um, actors that I know, writers that I know, um, who didn't get, I think, uh, really, and, and still don't get, really, what they, uh, and you know, and you know how talented they are, and how gifted they are, uh, and that, that's been tough to watch, um, because a lot of it has to do, uh, and, and it's something that I think, you know, we should bring up, is timing, um, that, but you're, you you know, you, you're lucky if you walk through the door at a certain point. You walk through that door 10 minutes later, they gave it to somebody else. You come in there 10 minutes before you got the gig. If, um, if, if George Bush isn't the president of the United States, uh, you know, it, it, you know the, the son isn't the president, doesn't become the president, and I don't, and I'm not prepped to be ready for that. Uh, and my career explodes in part because of that timing, because the of, of, of um, the Daily Show and Conan and and um, all of the explosion of uh, of um, cable television and cable news and 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 what was occurring in in you know in terms of, of what was occurring on the news, and all of a sudden that precise moment in time lifted me out from being just a guy working in clubs to all of a sudden I'm in really in theaters and on, and on TV a lot. That definitely makes a lot, makes a lot of sense. Uh, do you, uh, Ms. Wexler or Mr. Joseph, do you guys have anything to add about your least favorite thing or your uh, most favorite thing about your job? Yeah. Um, I'll say my most favorite thing has been, it's not been at all what I thought it would be. And I'm so thankful for that so far. Um, I just, I guess I had a vision of certain kind of projects I'd be working on and it's been a lot harder work and a lot more grind, um, but a variety of projects. I had my favorite stretch I think I've had was, uh, I went back to back, no days off doing a Yiddish operetta into uh, a new play with an all black cast about Malcolm X into Curly in Oklahoma and Shakespeare's loves, Lo loves labors lost. Just that sort of all kinds of different projects. That's what I love doing. I love that I've been able to go around the country and 
meet people everywhere, have this network everywhere and get to know all these communities. Um, there are arts everywhere around the country. There's so many flourishing and um, amazing artists everywhere. Uh, so that the least favorite thing, you know, sometimes it can be really challenging for me, I'll say, um, attaching self-worth to what you're doing right now, or if you get that job or not. Um, so learning to, uh, to just be resilient through it all. And, you know, sometimes it's good that I didn't book that thing or it's sad that I didn't, but life goes on. Um, yeah. Definitely great advice. And Mr. Joseph, any, you want to add about your least favorite thing or your favorite thing about your career? Uh, this, this might be my shortest answer. Uh, I love <laughs> everything about um, my career, and it, it's just, I just, I just love it. And it's, it's like Lewis was saying, like you know, you wake up and you look at, you maybe you have a twelve-hour day, you just don't look at it like that. I just, I every day when I wake up, if I have, you know, if I have something to do, um, it's. It's so exciting. It's just so exciting to me. I'm like, oh, today we're doing this, um, or today I'm making this song, or I'm I'm vibing with these guys. Uh, it's it's so exciting. I I really don't think I've <laughs> maybe, maybe I don't think I've been around along long enough to really find any specific drawbacks yet. Um, I mean, life is regular, right? You know, sometimes you gotta wake up early for something, or you work long time but it's like they say you do what you love you'll never work a day in your life and uh i'm just enjoying being able to do what i love that's my favorite thing about this job get to do what i want yeah i was i was just to give a sense of, i was literally broke broke till i was 40 broke and uh it never bothered me which is just nuts. I mean, that's crazy, but it was really, but it didn't because I was happy. Yeah. My parents are a little disturbed, but it, you know, they got used to it. <laughs> Thank you for giving us that insight. We're gonna squeeze in a YouTube question here. Um, so we'll start with Ms. Wexler. How did you learn to accept criticism? And do you have any advice of gaining confidence despite that criticism? So Ms. Wexler, Mr. Joseph and Mr. Black. Sure. Um, I think remembering that I want to continue to prove, uh, improve as an artist. And you can only do that through trying and failing and succeeding sometimes. And so you need someone to point out for you, um, especially at the beginning, I think, where you can get that improvement. I think it's also important to know that uh, you don't need to believe everyone's critique. <laughs> I think if, if it's in a learning environment, knowing who to trust in terms of feedback is very important and valuable, but just knowing that it's all to, to make the work better. Um, and yeah, in terms of being able to be okay with it, um, both taking your craft seriously, but also not taking yourself too seriously. And also remembering that it's all, it can all be playtime. You know, we all did it because it was so fun as kids. So, so finding that play in it, uh, is important. Uh, I, I love this question. Uh, cause as a classical, I was raised as a classical violinist. Okay. Um, in the, in that realm, people will tell you, your teachers or whoever will tell you immediately, that's bad. That sounds terrible. And you know what? A lot, pretty much every single time, they're right. Uh, and so at an early age, uh, I learned to have a thick skin when it comes to constructive criticism. And, you know, everybody in here, you're all intelligent especially at the thing that you're doing uh you know what you need to be better at and when people tell you what you need to be better at again listening to the right people like miss wexler said don't don't listen to the trolls on youtube or on instagram right but when somebody who you know seemingly cares about you somebody who's been teaching you um 
it can get harsh. I found that when I've studied with some of the greatest, you know, teachers uh, in the world, really, uh, that they don't like to waste their time. A lot of people won't waste their time, but that's because they already understand what greatness is. Uh, and they want you to get there as fast as possible. Uh, in that time, the time for feeling sensitive about it shouldn't be a priority. I think the really, I'm able to really look objectively when people say, Hey, you know, that that sucked or like that was too scratchy of a note i have a, a older sister who plays uh violin and to this day okay she teaches i'll i always send her my stuff hey check out this new song i just recorded check out this she'll I, lots of people will tell me oh i love this your friends will always oh this is so cool you know and it, it's true they're true but she'll be the one because she loves me and she wants to see me do well she'll say immediately that entire phrase right there and you should just play it. You should just do it again. I'm like, I just recorded this, this whole song. Like it, 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 it's already done. No, you should do it again. It's out of tune. It's scratchy. She's right. <laughs> and sometimes I don't do the song again, but I take the criticism and understand these are things I need to think about when I'm practicing to get even better, right? We can always get better. Uh, and I think that, a lot of people in the industry, people who understand the industry, uh, they don't have time. People who have really good advice for you, they don't have time to hold your hand through it. They want to tell you it and see you be open enough to just consider it. When people tell me things that I don't like, I don't even agree with advice-wise to this day, I'll still at least say... I can see what you might be saying. I'm not sure if I agree with you. I'm definitely going to think on it more. And sometimes I wake up the next morning and I go, yeah, he was right. <laughs> and it does nothing but make me better. And I think it's a big difference actually between what you would consider a professional and an almost professional. It's just that professional listen to what, some of the people were saying that he needed to work on or she needed to work on and they worked on it because they are the professional people are going to give you advice you have the capability and it's up to you so i think it's very 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 important to consider all criticism that's coming from the right place don't listen to the person who says i don't like your face they don't that that doesn't matter um but when it comes to what you're doing uh consider because you're not doing it just for yourself people are consuming your work yeah Thank you. Mr. Black, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think uh, during this time frame, uh, if you're sending stuff out in terms of YouTube or, you know, I think that one of the things that Brian said is, is really absolute. D during this time frame, especially YouTube, Instagram, uh, all of that stuff, you send it out and you get anything back. You, you read it, whatever you want. You pay no, throw it out. Throw it out. These are people who are confined. They've got nothing but time on their hands. I read stuff that's written to me, okay? And I go, <laughs> and I even now go, gee, they didn't get my joke. And I get upset and I'm going, then you go, what, what, this, this person lives, but this is a, gee, this person. And then I look at their uh, their page and I go, the person's insane. I listen to an insane person. Throw that out. You deal with people, and this is tough, it will be, it is always tough afterwards when we're back to dealing in the way we in the public square okay is is that the hardest part is dealing with is figuring out who it is that's giving you the criticism and it is just self-confident so that that criticism is meaningless because they're just spouting stuff because that's how they continue because we are in a culture in which self-confidence is valued over intelligence and so you have to be able to separate the intelligent, uh, the real criticism you're getting from the bogus. And that's at times tough, but you learn that over time as you grow as an artist. Thank you for that. I think criticism is a big thing that a lot of our students um, were looking for and trying to figuring out how they can take that about. Um, and just a reminder, we have about 
15 minutes left in our program and we want to get as many questions as we can in. So we will um, continue with this one. But besides being a performer, what are some of the behind the scenes careers and jobs that your interest that interest you and that may be of interest to the students who are watching? We can start this off with Mr. Black, um, Ms. Wexler, and then Mr. Joseph. I, I, I'm past having an interest in, <laughs> I mean, I like teaching. And uh, that that's the one thing. And not like the history of or playwriting, but certain things within that, such as here's, here's a, you know, spending a week with someone and with students and going, uh, you know, you've entered the room and then by the end of the week, you'll, you'll get up and do comedy. But before you, before you, you know, by the time I get you up, you won't, it'll be two days later before you realize you even did it, which is allows you to get up there and do it. Um, so, so that's really, uh, it's the teaching end. Uh, for myself, I, I think I will definitely want to um, get into producing and directing uh, the later into my career I get. I really have an interest in um having more say in the crafting of the story that's being told. Um, but also in terms of other careers, I, I think if you have an interest in the arts and you think, well, but maybe I'm not a performer, there are so many different things you can do um, behind the scenes, whether it's you know stage managing, you wanna be in on the action that way, or you, know, you could be an accountant on a movie or something. You know, there are so many different ways you can you can get involved yeah uh th i think that's really good uh for me i just i <laughs> so yeah it's kind of a hard question to answer because i definitely just i love what i do um the one thing i could see myself you know doing extra and i i think it's more of just an extension uh of it but as a talented individual who also enjoys consuming talent myself i feel like i i have a good eye for talent amongst my peers colleagues and people i like i get to meet so i think further on a little later down the line something i really want to do is uh be able to sign young artists young creatives and facilitate them and mentor them in to do what they do the best you know um for, <laughs> but hopefully i feel like i picked my horse here um i see a lot <laughs> you know uh maybe back me up on this you guys but i think a lot of people especially when they're first trying to make it you know in in the arts have you know a backup plan right or or actually rather are treating the arts more like a lottery ticket as like okay i'll do a few scratch offs and if i get it then i'm in but if not i'm just doing this other thing which is which is fine you have to you know know what what you're about but if what you're about is truly in your heart saying i want to be in the arts this is what will make me happy if that's my job for the rest of my life then you gotta kind of zone in on that and make that the priority. Um, and so me being pretty early on in my career, I'd say I'm still doing that. So I haven't thought too much other than doing the classic, classical, typical, you know, Jay-Z, I'm going I'm to build myself a record label and all that. But I think that stays within the realm of what I'm doing. See, and, uh, you know, it, thank you for shedding light on all of those different aspects of the industry. I feel like a lot of people aren't fully aware of what goes into uh, the entertainment industry and, uh, you know, some of the business aspects of it. Um, a student asked, uh, Judith Ramon and Love and Hate Nation mean so much to them and other uh, queer kids out there. What's your favorite part about bringing that character to life, Miss Wexler? Thank you. Uh, I'm glad people connect with that show. Um the show itself, I think, is a beautiful way for uh, uh, queer people, black people. So many people are represented in that show. Um, playing Judith Ramone, though, was very fun for me because that was really a way for me to tap into uh, the joy of transformation in acting. Sometimes it's so fun to 
play someone who's closer to myself in terms of getting able to represent that on stage. But Judith is not like me. She she was the mean girl. She's a chain smoker. She has a lot of tension. Um, so that was fun to just transform. Um, I will say it kind of hurt after a while, though, because of all that, the physical transformation. If that show had run longer, I would have uh, had to get, you know, regular massages or something. But um, yeah, getting to to be someone completely different was the joy of that. And thank you, thank you for loving that show. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, this is the next question is for our, all our speakers. How do you find work or gigs and how do you get paid? We can start with Mr. Black, um, Mr. Joseph and then end with Ms. Wexler. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm at that point where they just, call, you know, but usually they call me or they, you know, I have an audition. I mean, that's, um, you know, I'm in that position now where I'm, I'm lucky that those that's a given. Um, or then I just get to go, OK, I'm going to I'm just going to, uh, you know, hang out somewhere with my friends and, and not do nothing. But usually, you know, if it's there's one thing or another comes up. So it was, uh, you know, I just I just had a you know, I did, a you know, an animation that's recently coming out, just a short animation. You know, there's just little things that pop up, especially now. So um, it's like this. You guys called me. That's how I get it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Mr. Joseph, can you add on to that? Um, well, yeah, definitely to agree with that, uh, you know, first off, that's once you, I, I think, become recognized and vetted in this business, you just get a call, you get an email, um, and you respond to it. Uh, so work sort of comes, but I think I know where a lot of you are feeling, uh, especially in the audience here on YouTube. Uh, earlier on, it wasn't, okay, I put it this way, it wasn't more than three years ago, not e yeah, just three years ago, where I was begging places for a job. Here in LA, I was living, I was trying to make my rent, right? I'm trying to not, not, not be a, I'm trying to, at this point, not even just try and be a successful musician. I'm trying to, you know, not ask my mom for the rent money. And, <laughs> and you know, I'm literally, uh, the YouTube was a first, my first foray in trying to expose myself. You know, they talk about exposure. Uh, but it's when I got to the point of being ready for the big time and then proving myself on the big stage, uh, then you wake up and people are going to want you that when people see what you do and everything like that, um, but before that, I will say it is a grind. Um, you're most likely not going to get a, some big Hollywood agent who flew into town, who randomly says, hey, I, you're going to be my next star. It, it's not a wholly common occurrence. So you have to really buckle down and be ready for the gigs you won't get the gigs until you're truly ready nobody's going to pick you up and train you for the gig they want somebody who's ready now um so until you get the chance for your preparation to be met by opportunity continue to prepare um put yourself out there as much as you can uh but it like i said it's just going to be a grind get what you can uh when you do make gig relationships with people when you get when i got that first gig from the people who found me on the street with step africa i went on to do their annual show the next year and the next year when you first get those gigs when you meet these people be the best that you can be be the poster girl or the poster boy that you envision yourself in your head because callbacks are real everyone in the industry talks to each other how was he how was she um so work hard do well and um eventually you get to the point like mr black saying you know he just gets the calls pixar calls him and says hey we you may not know who we are <laughs> You know, and it, that it's it's awesome, you know. So, yeah. Thank Blue you. The Thank you. I do want to remind our speakers that we only have a couple of minutes left. So 
try to keep their answers short as possible. Thank you, Mr. Joseph. Um, Ms. Wexler, do you have anything you want to add? Sure. I'll say just technically, if people are interested, the the way for me, it's I, I have an agent and they send me auditions and then I send it back to them and then I get the job or I don't. <laughs> um, there are though times where because of these connections I've made in the business, I will just get something directly, um, whether it's a, a full production of something or just like, Hey, we're, you know, reading this script. Um, are you available? So things like that happen. And, um, yeah, so that's why it's very important to, to maintain your relationships and build your networks because they might just be able to offer you this small reading this week, but next week, maybe it'll be, you know, the full play or the full movie. Mm -hmm. Thank you for those amazing answers. Um, we have another question from YouTube. Did you have any backup plan if your path um, in your career didn't go the way you wanted? We can start with um, Mr. Joseph, Ms. Wexler, and then Mr. Black. Not really. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's the short answer. Uh, I I've I told myself if I end up. I moved to LA with $50 in my pocket. I said, if I end up in a box doing what I love, playing on the side of the highway, hopefully not, right? But if that's what happens, I'm okay with it. I, I truly just believe in doing what makes you happy. Um, you could be a high earner. I know lots of people who make tons of money doing jobs that they hate. They're not happy. So I think just being happy is super important. I didn't have a backup plan. Uh, I'll say I haven't had one and I don't have one, so I'm sticking it out. <laughs> yeah. And I, uh, I was going to be a podiatrist. I, actually, what I was going to do was teach. I was going to teach theater mm -hmm. and use that to do what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But it was still involved with what I wanted to do. Yeah, I, I agree with that too. Yeah. I would, I would teach, uh, cause it's better. It, exactly. It's, in the same same realm of what I'm doing, so. So um, thank you for for your answers on that. It's funny to see how you've all stuck out with your career and have been dedicated to it. Uh, Summer asked, you know, we're we're in the middle of a pandemic right now. How has that impacted your job, and how has that impacted the way you work, um, Mr. Joseph? Let's begin with you. Oh man, I miss shows. I definitely miss shows. So it's, it's, it's very different. Um, you know, not being able to see lots of people on the road. I miss meeting my, you know, I miss meeting my, my fans. I met my supporters and, um, that's, like I said, it's really fun for me. So it's okay though. Um, I've just been working more. It gives me more time to work on myself. Uh, when you hit it big in this business, you can get really, really busy. Okay. And, you might not be able to practice as much or work on some of the craft that you normally work on yourself at home because you're so booked and busy. So it's just a transition. I'm able to record more uh, and prepare more for when those shows do come back and everything like that. Yeah, I, I've worked primarily in theater so far and theater's not happening. So it, it's been a challenging year. I had work lined up and it's gone. Um, but so many people have lost so many things. Um, it has allowed me time, uh, for a lot of my own things, which has been great. My own development. I also will say it's been financially challenging, but the number one thing I want to say is that I don't want this time to discourage any of you if you're interested in pursuing this field. Um, yes, things are hard right now. We still need all of you to, to, to get into the arts if that's what you love and to follow it, even if it's, you know, live performance. I miss acting with people. I'm sick of acting to this camera lens. Um, but it, we, we still have the arts, we still need the arts. And so, um, you can still work on it, even if you're at home and you can still pursue it if that's what you like to do. Yeah. And I, uh, it certainly changed it because, uh, otherwise I wouldn't have the time to do this. <laughs> uh, I'd be doing something else. I, no, I mean, I'm glad that I do have the time to do it, but, uh, it's, for me, it's a, there's, there's guys who like the guys going into comedy clubs. I'm not going into a comedy club. You got to be crazy, okay? It's, I mean, it's just people are laughing, and that means eh, and stuff flies out. No, we're at Zoom comedy, which is really psychotic. Which is like Tatiana said, is like you know you're talking to who, 
and uh, and it's uh, finally it's it, it, you know it's it's been it's been tough, but I you know you can write, I can write, I can do. There's other things that, that come along, you know, that I can kind of futz around with, but uh, but I just I just want to say quickly because I think it's important. That it, you, the, the choice, if you're wondering, gee, if I made the right choice, you, you don't have to wonder about it. You'll do it. Okay? It's not like you have a choice. Once you've decided this is it, if you have a choice, you'll do something else. Okay? Don't worry about it back then. Right? Um, and, you. you know, it, it's, it's a choice. Then you make, if you make that choice, I guarantee uh, if you don't want to do it, you'll, you'll leave because most of us, the three of us who were talking to you, you know, we, we didn't, you don't really have a choice once you make the choice. Okay, that's it. I'm stuck. What else am I going to do? Yeah, for sure. I think that is a great point to bring up. Um, and we are about our time um, is ending already together, but we have one final question. If we can make this really quick, a few students have asked, do you have any quick career tips or advice for aspiring artists? Whoever would like to start may start. Don't give up. It's going to be hard. There are going to be times where you're going to say, why is nobody caring? Those are the times just to hold on and keep going. The harder you work, the better the payoff. Just keep up at it. Uh, build up your community. Find people you trust. Um, stay, stay hungry and stay curious and, and take care of yourself. And networking is is not the answer. The answer is do it and then do it again 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 and then do it again. And then when you think you've done enough, do it some more. That's right. Awesome. Thank you all for your time today. And thank you to all the students who submitted questions. You know, I think the entertainment and arts industry can be so big and so daunting. So thank you guys for really giving us the specifics about your journeys. And I really appreciated this conversation and your stories and uh, all the advice that you gave. For students interested in learning about MCPS career readiness programs, please visit the website on screen. MCPS offers a number of programs that provide students real world learning experiences, college credit and industry certifications. And thanks to all the students who tuned in today. Let's show on screen now the QR code and a bit.ly address. Both the QR code and link will take you to a survey where you can provide us feedback about today's show and future programs. The bit.ly address is bit.ly slash let's talk career survey. Please take the time to share your thoughts and ideas with us. Thank you. And check our website, www.mcpsletstalkcareers.org to watch past episodes and learn about career readiness programs that MCPS offers to students. Tune in next month on Wednesday, March 10th from 10 to 1130 for the next Let's Talk Careers when we'll be talking about careers in engineering with guests from Lockheed Martin, Rivian, Northrop Grumman, and Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission. That is going to be an amazing discussion. That's all for today. This is Ashley from Gaithersburg. And Taylor from Wheaton and Thomas Edison. And Nick from Richard Montgomery signing off. Bye. 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 Bye.